I'm going to tell you a minute ago, don't step on that rainbow on the floor. But it all looks so good with all that sunshine coming through the window over there on that side. Now I want everybody on that side to move to this. No. I really do want that to happen, but maybe someday that will happen. Uh, we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. If you're not going to move to that side, when church is over today, say hello to somebody on that side. So and vice versa. We're not. Yeah, and vice versa, that's correct. These are some of the words that we use to greet the other people. We use them at church on Sunday morning, and we use them in a lot of different times during the week. And now that the Christmas holiday season has started, we're going to get even more chances as we gather with friends and family. And, and I pray that when you think friends and family, you include your church family in that, because we are here today and every Sunday as a family. And, and so my prayer is that that would be included. There are also other ways that we can make people feel welcome. We know because we heard John preach two Sundays ago that he likes to say he is delighted that you are here. <laughs> See, John, I did listen to your sermon. I'm excited. I'm delighted. I'm excited. He's delighted. If you've been here at all during the past 11 months, you know that I'm so excited that you're here. And John, I did try to find something that said I'm delighted. Um, how can I put this? That might be an outdated term, maybe. <laughs> uh, I found one, and it included excited, but I put it up there anyway. Uh, uh, I'm delighted, excited, and deeply honored. And I think that slide would describe how John and I both feel about being able to preach the Word of God and about being able to do it here at Walton Hills Church. So... Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. We have all these words and phrases that we can use to make people feel welcome. We even have maps that we can put in front of our door that tell people they're welcome. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever went somewhere and felt unwelcome? I hear you people laughing, but you know what? You can go online and buy that. And put that in front of your door. It's an actual picture of an unwelcome mat. All I can say is, wow. Uh, I'd like to think that anybody that would do that would just have a work sense of humor like me. But the reality is that there are people out there who don't welcome other people into their personal space. Whether that be their home or whatever. And there are a lot of reasons why people might behave that way. I'm sure some of those people would be able to justify their behavior, at least to themselves, if not to anyone else. First and foremost, busyness is one of the things that gets in the way of hospitality. We're just too busy. If we're go we want to spend time with other people, right? But if we're going to do that, we have to schedule that, don't we? Because there are just too many things going on. Most of us simply don't have time for unexpected visitors. Some people are opposed to guests, particularly uninvited or unexpected guests, because of what those guests might find when they show up. Not any fingers anywhere. John, I think you're vouched for me, girl. I think you're vouched for me. That's especially true when you're a preacher. Comes or not. Again, not pointing any fingers, I'm not saying that of you folks, of course. And while it's not done nearly as often as it was in the past, the door to door salesman was another reason that people didn't want to be bothered. Today, that looks more like a telemarketer than a door to door salesman, but if you're anything like me, my response to them has always been and will always be. If I want what you're buying, I'll call you. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work out that way. Finally, we may make it a point to unwelcome people who can steal our spotlight. It happens in our schools. 
when that new student shows up and now they're the most popular kid in the school. It happens in our workplaces when that new employee is suddenly the great, next great thing for the company that you've given years of your life to. And here comes this new person. It also happens in the church. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine making someone feel unwelcome at church? Some of you might say no way, while others of you may have been made to feel unwelcome in a church at some time in your life. It's usually not as blatant as it might be in the school cafeteria or the work lunchroom or at the front door. And we might even claim that it's unintentional. We just simply didn't get a chance to welcome that visitor. That's very possible on an individual basis, but I would argue that if making people know that they are welcome as a priority of a body of believers, then that person will be made to feel that way by somebody at some point on any given Sunday. I know there are some of you here who look for new and unfamiliar faces each and every Sunday, and you make it a point of greeting and welcoming the people behind those faces. And I just want to say thank you for that, because it's important. We want to feel welcome, don't we? We should welcome others as well. A few months ago, as I was studying and planning the last parts of this sermon series, I was reading what John had to say in the last three letters that we find in the New Testament. The idea that stuck with me after I initially read it, obviously, was that the idea that someone in the church had refused to welcome visitors. In this case, the visitors were actually fellow followers of Jesus. I don't know about you, but the idea of an unwelcoming Christian sounds like an oxymoron. They just don't seem to go together. And as you can see, that led me to choose the title, Unwelcome, for the message this morning. And then as I read and studied a little deeper, it dawned on me that this wasn't just a letter meant to condemn the person in the church who was doing something wrong, it was also a letter that acknowledged and commended and encouraged those who were doing things the way they should be done. We talked about his app on his phone, so whatever you're using, your app or your Bible, or whatever it may be, you can go ahead and open it to the book of 3 John. As I said last week, as far as number of words used, it's the shortest book in the Bible. The other thing that's unique about this letter is that it's written to a specific individual. As one commentator put it, 3 John is a genuine, highly personal letter, yet with a clear, official purpose. It's personal because the elder in this case, John, obviously had a prior relationship to the recipient of the letter. Before I point out how we know that, what I want us to see is that there are three very different people who are mentioned in the letter. And they re represent three very different kinds of people who are a part of the community of believers that John was writing to, and I'm going to argue that they're also a part of the church today. Yeah, here it comes. As I talk about each of them, I want us to think about them a little bit differently than we normally would. Another part of the studying that I was doing earlier in the week had to do with the Sunday School lesson that we were going to have this morning in the Pairs and Spares class. And that Sunday School lesson was based on the fact that there is no condemnation in Christ. We didn't do that today because we did some other things. But there was a quote from Max Lucado that I want us to think about this morning. Max said, God put scales on Paul's eyes so thick that the only way he could look was inward. I'm going to ask us to look inward today. I'm going to ask us to not do what we normally do. Because here's what we normally do as Christians. When we hear a sermon, we think, I know somebody who needs to hear that. Don't we? The 
As I talk about each of them today, I want us to think of which one of these, which of these traits we have inside of us. We're good at thinking of people who we know that exhibit negative traits or less than positive traits. Today, rather than thinking of someone else or looking around to see who might be squirming in their seat, I want us to squirm in our seat. I want us, each of us as individuals, to look inward and determine which of these traits live in us. So the first thing I have to do is introduce you to three people. Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. Anybody know anybody with those names? Demetrius, maybe. I know that you're smart enough to figure it out, but I'll tell you that had I studied Hebrew before choosing a title for this message, this is what I would have called it. <coughs> Don't be a Demetrius. Demetrius. You'll understand why as we go through. Let's read the first part of the short letter and see what we can learn about ourselves, shall we? The Elder. To my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. This is the part where we can see that John has a prior relationship with Gaius. He refers to him as a dear friend and as one of his children. John was his father in the faith. We hear Paul also refer to many of his disciples, those who learned under him, as his children. He was a leader, and Gaius was obviously a disciple of John who is now held in a position of influence. But guess what? That position of influence has not gone to his head. It's obvious that John is quite pleased with the way that Gaius is walking in the truth. It's a pretty huge compliment for someone to say that they pray your physical health is as good as your spiritual health. Gaius was walking in the truth, and others were relaying that information to John. If you read the next four verses, you'll see that John is commending Gaius for the way he received and showed hospitality to visiting brothers in Christ. That is, I mean, that wasn't always the case. first century, followers of Jesus traveled great distances and spread the gospel. And they relied on these scattered congregations for hospitality during those travels. Sound familiar? It's the same today. Today we call them missionaries. They didn't get any help, it says in our text, from pagans, meaning the world or outside the church. It's the church's responsibility to show them hospitality, and to help them financially if necessary. Enough about that, though. Getting back to Gaius and us, based on what you read on the screen, verses 2 through 4, could ask yourself, could your spiritual parents, that might very well be your biological parents, that might be another influential Christian, that might be a number of people, during your lifetime, the question is, did they write those words to you based on how you're living today? I don't see anybody smiling. Let's move on starting at first number. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. 
So when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Me, Diotrephes. Apparently this guy has some issues, huh? It's pretty clear that this is the main reason that John's written this letter to his dear friend. It's also clear that Diotrephes is a, also a leader. He might be the top, top guy in this particular congregation that John's writing to. John wrote him a letter. And we have to assume, it doesn't say so, but we have to assume that the letter was asking that the traveling missionaries be welcome and that perhaps even given financial support as they made their way across the region. We don't know if Diatrophus responded to John or if he simply just ignored the letter. If that's the case, then other people went to John and told him what was going on, what was being said, and what was being done. And we don't even know exactly what Diotrephus did or said, but John does give us an idea of why he behaved the way he did. Diotrephus, who loves to be first. Looks like this leader was a little self-centered. Maybe he felt threatened by John standing in the church. Could that happen? Yes, that could happen. I'll tell you how I know from experience that that can happen. There are preachers who won't even consider allowing someone else to stand in their pulpit on a Sunday morning. In their church body, that's a spotlight that they're not willing to share. Another possibility could be that Diatrophus didn't want to share whatever resources the church had. Maybe he wanted to keep it all for himself. His desire to remain number one extends all the way past refusing to show hospitality. He goes as far as to tell other people they can't show hospitality either. And then kicking them out if they dare to do so. As I said, this might be because of insecurity in his position, or it may have been that he had twisted or distorted the gospel and was afraid of being exposed by his visitors. Maybe he wasn't walking in the truth. And that would certainly put his position of authority in danger. Here's the thing, though. Regardless of his motivation, it's clear that he wanted nothing to do with John and nothing to do with these missionaries. So here comes introspection opportunity number two. Have you ever, for any reason, refused hospitality to a fellow follower of Jesus? For any reason? I don't want you to answer me. I want you to ask yourself that question. Here's another question. Have you ever talked negatively about another Christian in an attempt to justify your lack of hospitality? Well, I didn't welcome them in because. Our text tells us that the so-called villain of the story spread malicious rumors about John and the missionaries. Here's the thing, though. John says, when I come, I'm going to call him out. I will call attention to what he is doing. That sounds pretty harsh. And to me, when I read it, it doesn't seem to match up with John's reputation as the apostle of love. What we have to understand is that John's love for people is a direct result of his love for Jesus and the gospel. 
I'd suggest that John's issue with Diatrophus was about Diatrophus being a person in a position of leadership failing to practice what Jesus preached. That was John's problem with the situation. I'd also argue that the same level of responsibility lands on not just leaders, but on everyone claiming the name of Christian. simply boils down to what John writes in the letter. Do not imitate evil, but imitate what is good. Imitate Jesus. Finally, John calls attention to one more God. And we don't know anything more about Demetrius other than what we read in verse 12. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Just to give you some maybe background, some scholars believe that Demetrius may have been the guy delivering this letter. If that's the case, then John wants Gaius to know some things about Demetrius' character. Others feel like he might have been the person who told John about what Diotrephus was up to, or maybe he was a missionary that John would soon be sending in the near future. We don't know. But what we do know is that John holds Demetrius in very high regard. He calls him well spoken of by everyone. No one who knows Demetrius has a bad thing to say about him. It's pretty impressive, don't you think? Everyone speaks well of him. John and his colleagues also speak well of him, which would mean something to Gaius because he respects John and John's opinions. We also see that the author says that Demetrius is spoken well of even by the truth itself. The truth of the gospel is what guides the life and actions of Demetrius. People can tell he believes what he says he believes because he lives what he says he believes. Like Gaius, who's walking in the truth, his confession matches his way of living. As the Apostle Paul would say, Demetrius is producing the fruit of the Spirit in his life. John might perceive Demetrius as living a life of love. So take this third opportunity to look inside and ask yourself, can people feel confident speaking well of you as a Christian? And does your lifestyle speak well of your claim to being? Tough questions, right? They are tough questions. I hope we'll think about them in the days and weeks to come as we continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus and our relationships with each other. Because that's the whole point. Is that we continue to grow in our love. They're tough questions, but they're questions that definitely apply to us if, if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have to consider these behaviors, these character things. Because you can't walk in the truth until you've accepted the truth, but once you've accepted the truth, you're expected to walk and live in that truth. So that's for those of us that are in Christ. If you're here today and you've never made a commitment, guess what? These questions don't apply to you. Yes. And if you're in a position where you want to take that step this morning, or even if you just want more information before you take that step, you can come forward. We always stand and sing 
offer an invitation. Right now, the question you have to ask yourself is, will I? And if not, why not? What's holding you back? The thing we have to understand is that the questions never stop. They just go inward. If you want to do that, come forward as we say, we'll take those steps with you. But as for the rest of us, don't be God. Let's pray. God, we love you and we pray. We want so desperately for you to form us, for you to shape us, for you to make us into disciples that reflect Jesus. That we would be welcoming, that we would be loving that we would be living with what we say we believe so that other people would come to know your son Jesus. I pray if there's anyone here this morning that's never made a commitment to follow him, to repair their broken relationship with you through him, that they would make that decision today and that we as the church would welcome them with open arms, not just today, but every day. Father, I pray that as we go out into the world, people see us. And they see Jesus reflected in us. And that they want to come to know more about Him and your gift of praise. <coughs> as we wrap up our worship service today, I pray that we continue to worship as we leave this building. Always and forever glorifying you through the name of your Son Jesus. And that name I pray.